The air is thick, warm, and heavy with the scent of damp earth, resinous conifers, and blooming cycads you can't name. A low hum of oversized insects fills your ears, a constant thrumming chorus in this ancient world. Ferns, as tall as you are, brush against your arms as you push through the undergrowth. You step into a clearing, and that's when the sun vanishes. A shadow, vast and cool, sweeps over you. The ground gives a deep, resonant shudder. Not a sharp quake, but the cushioned footfall of something impossibly heavy. You look up, and up, and up. Before you stand not a tree, but a leg. It is a column of muscle and bone, wider than any tree trunk you've ever seen, covered in a landscape of wrinkled, pebbled skin. Ever wonder what it truly felt like to stand in the shadow of a living giant? To feel the world vibrate with its every step? Let us know in the comments where you're watching from, and which magnificent creature from our planet's distant past captures your imagination the most. Now, let's journey back in time and uncover the story of a lost world. Your eyes follow the pillar of that leg upwards, past a knee joint the size of a boulder, to a body that rivals the scale of a modern whale. This is Brachiosaurus, and its presence redefines the very concept it stands nearly 40 feet tall, a living, breathing, four-story building of flesh and bone. From its gently swaying tail to the tip of its snout, it stretches over 80 feet, the length of two city buses parked end to end. Yet despite its scale, there is a strange grace to it. It moves with a slow, deliberate majesty, its immense weight carried on four sturdy limbs. Its name, Brachiosaurus, means arm lizard, a clue to its most unusual feature. Unlike its more famous sauropod cousins, whose hips were the highest point on their body, this giant was built uphill. Its front limbs were significantly longer than its hind limbs, giving it a powerful, giraffe-like posture. This is the creature that ruled the high canopy of the late Jurassic, a living mountain that browsed where no other could reach. The air itself seems to bend around its form, and you feel an instinctual, primal awe for this peaceful titan, a gentle connoisseur of treetops in a world of savage hunters. This uphill design is what makes Brachiosaurus a true standout. You are looking at a biological blueprint utterly distinct from its contemporaries. Imagine other long-necked giants you know, like Diplodocus. They were built like suspension bridges, long, low, and level, with their powerful legs anchored at the hips, their necks and tails balancing each other out. They were masters of the low to mid-level brows. But Brachiosaurus rejected that design entirely. It tilted the whole chassis forward, pouring its strength into its shoulders and forelimbs. You can almost see the immense power coiled in its chest and shoulders. A muscular arrangement, more like a weightlifter than a marathon runner. The shoulder blade alone is a marvel a massive plank of bone anchoring the arm that gives the lizard its name. It is the fulcrum for lifting not just the neck, but the entire front half of its colossal body, allowing the neck to begin its journey to the sky from an already elevated platform. Hollywood often shows these creatures with their necks ramrod straight, like a periscope, but the reality was likely a more stable, energy-efficient angle, a majestic 45-degree slope arcing into the heavens. This posture wasn't just for show. It was a specialist's adaptation, 
giving it exclusive access to a food source dozens of feet above its competition. It didn't compete with the other sauropods on the floodplain. It lived above them. This titan wasn't just in a different weight class. It was in a different world. A vertical browser in a horizontal ecosystem. Its head, perched at the end of that incredible cantilever, seems impossibly small for such a behemoth. A tiny instrument of precision at the end of a massive biological crane. That small head, perched so high in the sky, is now moving with purpose through the canopy of a world that is both alien and strangely familiar. You are standing in the late Jurassic, around 150 million years ago, in the vast expanse known to science as the Morrison Formation. Forget the steamy, endless jungles of popular imagination. This is a world of seasons. For part of the year, it is a landscape of immense, slow-moving rivers and lush floodplains, a network of green corridors teeming with life. But for the other part, the land dries, the rivers shrink, and the air grows hazy with dust. It is a tougher, more rugged world than you might think. The forests are not tropical, but are dominated by towering conifers, trees like Araucaria, and other ancient relatives of modern monkey puzzle pines. Their branches are thick and woody. Their leaves are tough, waxy needles. Not exactly a tender salad. Below these giants, the mid-story is a gallery of prehistoric survivors. You see groves of cycads, which look like short, stout palm trees with fiercely robust, frond-like leaves. Sprawling fields of ferns cover the ground like a carpet. And along the riverbanks, you can spot the distinctive, fan-shaped leaves of ginkgo trees, a true living fossil whose descendants still grace our city streets today. This is the buffet. The low-lying ferns and cycads are food for the other, lower-built sauropods like Diplodocus and Camarasaurus. But the high canopy, the tough, sun-baked needles of the tallest conifers that belongs to Brachiosaurus. It gazes out over a world it shares with armored Stegosaurus and the ever-present threat of the great predator, Allosaurus, who likely watches from the cover of the tree lines. This is not just a habitat. It is a complex, living tapestry woven with relationships of predator, prey, and competitor. High above the floodplain, you watch the feeding strategy unfold. The head, a surprisingly delicate instrument on the end of that muscular boom, dips into a cluster of high-altitude conifer branches. There is no chewing, no careful mastication. Instead, the jaws clamp down, and with a powerful pull of its neck, the dinosaur rakes the branch clean. It's simple, peg-like teeth are not grinders. They are the tines of a massive rake, designed for one purpose, to strip foliage and small twigs and funnel it all into the gullet. A huge bolus of tough, resinous plant matter begins its long, 10-meter journey down the esophagus, a slow-motion cascade traveling to a stomach that has to deal with this coarse delivery. This is where the true ingenuity of the sauropod digestive system comes into play. Since it couldn't chew, Brachiosaurus brought the mountain to Muhammad, so to speak. Deep within its gut, it maintained a collection of stones, some as large as your fist. These are called gastroliths, or stomach stones. The dinosaur would swallow these rocks, and they would accumulate in a powerful, muscular organ akin to a bird's gizzard. As the unprocessed bundles of needles and twigs arrived, this internal rock tumbler would go to work, 
The powerful muscles of the gizzard would churn the stones against the plant matter, grinding it, pulverizing it, and breaking down the tough cellulose fibers that would otherwise be indigestible. It was a biological millstone, a fermenting factory deep inside a living mountain, working tirelessly to extract every last calorie from a low-nutrition food source to fuel a body of this magnitude. This process could never stop. You are witnessing an eating machine that likely consumed hundreds of kilograms of food every single day, a non-stop cycle of stripping, swallowing, and internal grinding, all to power the enormous, slow-burning furnace required to keep a giant on its feet. That internal furnace required an engine of unbelievable power. Just think of the physics involved. To pump oxygenated blood from its heart all the way up that sloping neck to its brain, nearly 30 feet in the air, would require staggering pressure. You are looking at a creature that needed a heart the size of an armchair, a muscular pump weighing perhaps 400 kilograms, beating with a slow, powerful rhythm that would send tremors through its entire chest cavity. It would need to be strong enough to drive a column of blood straight up, defying gravity with every beat. Scientists speculate it must have had a complex system of one-way valves lining its arteries, much like a modern giraffe, to prevent a catastrophic rush of blood to the brain whenever it lowered its head to drink. This incredible cardiovascular engineering leads you to a bigger question. Was this giant warm-blooded or cold-blooded? For a long time, dinosaurs were imagined as sluggish reptiles, basking in the Sunday. But to power this lifestyle, a cold-blooded metabolism seems insufficient. The modern consensus leans toward a fascinating middle ground called gigantothermy. Because Brachiosaurus was so immense, its surface area was relatively small compared to its volume. It was a walking thermos, retaining its body heat with incredible efficiency. It generated heat from its digestive processes and muscle movement, and its sheer bulk kept that warmth locked in. It was a warm-hearted giant by virtue of its own scale. And to fuel this warm, active body, it needed a supremely efficient breathing system. Like modern birds, it had a network of air sacs connected to its lungs that invaded its bones, making them lighter. This system allowed for a constant, one-way flow of fresh air, meaning its blood was super oxygenated. The deep, resonant sound of its breath is not just air filling a pair of lungs, it's the sound of a sophisticated, high-performance engine at work. And this all brings our attention back to its head, and the most curious feature of its skull, a large, high-domed crest with a giant opening right on top. For nearly a century, that high, domed opening in the skull sparked one of the most enduring images in all of paleontology. Scientists and artists alike imagined Brachiosaurus as a semi-aquatic giant, wading into deep lakes to escape predators or find food, its body fully submerged while its head broke the surface. The crest, they believed, was a perfectly placed snorkel. It's a beautiful, romantic idea, but one that crumbles under the simple laws of physics. Imagine the immense pressure of the water 30 feet down. It would have squeezed the dinosaur's chest with such force that it would have been impossible for its lungs to expand. It would have suffocated. This majestic creature was no submarine. It was a creature of the land. So where were its nostrils? A closer look at the skull, tracing the paths of nerves and blood vessels, reveals the truth. The fleshy nasal passages didn't lead to the top of the crest. They traveled down the snout to openings low on the face, 
right where you'd expect them to be on any land animal. The grand nasal arch on its head was just bone. The soft, fleshy nostrils that drew in the Jurassic air were located at the front of its mouth. So if it wasn't a snorkel, what was this bizarre hollow dome for? The leading theory is that it was a resonance chamber. The hollow space could have amplified the sounds it made, turning a simple vocalization into a deep, booming call that could echo for miles across the plains. A way to communicate with distant herd members. Another compelling idea is that it served as a display structure, a unique billboard for species recognition. In life, it may have been covered in colorful skin, a vibrant signal to rivals and potential mates. This was a confident animal, a high browser that stood tall at the peak of its ecosystem. Its sheer size, a defense against all but the most desperate pack of Allosaurus. The crest was a feature not of a shy, hiding animal, but of a dynamic, social titan. This journey from a waterlogged lurker to a terrestrial titan shows how our understanding of these animals is always evolving. The story of Brachiosaurus itself began not in a film, but in the dry badlands of western Colorado in the summer of 1900. There, a paleontologist named Elmer Riggs unearthed bones of a truly baffling scale. The immense forelimb bone, the humerus, was longer than a man is tall, and it was this discovery of a colossal arm that gave the new dinosaur its name. For the first time, the world had proof of a sauropod built on a completely different chassis, a creature that sloped upwards to the sky. For decades, it held the title of the largest dinosaur ever discovered, and the mounted skeletons like the iconic one that has greeted visitors at Chicago's Field Museum for generations, became monuments to the sheer possibility of life. These skeletons fired the public's imagination, but it was a single moment in cinema that made it a global superstar. In 1993, audiences watched as digital technology brought Brachiosaurus to life. The first dinosaur revealed in Jurassic Park, it rose on its hind legs in a moment of pure, unadulterated movie magic, its colossal form backlit by the Sunday. That scene cemented its place in our collective hearts, defining it for millions as the gentle, awe-inspiring giant. It's a testament to the creature's power that even though some details in that portrayal are now debated by science, the spirit of the scene, the overwhelming sense of majesty, was perfectly true to the animal. Our perception has shifted from bones, to snorkel myths, to cinematic marvels. But with each step, the reality of Brachiosaurus has become even more wondrous. The journey back across 150 million years comes to a gentle close. The humid air of the Jurassic gives way to the familiar air of your own time. The rumble of the giant's footsteps fading into a deep and lasting silence. The great animal is gone, but it is not entirely lost to us. It sleeps in the rock, in the fossilized bones that are carefully excavated and brought into the light of our world. When you stand before its skeleton in a museum, you are not just looking at a relic of a forgotten age. You are looking at a story written in bone, a testament to the incredible forms life can take. The shadow of Brachiosaurus still falls upon us, reminding us that the ground beneath our feet holds histories far grander and more ancient than our own, waiting for a curious mind to piece them back together and let them walk again if only in our imagination.